All right, I'm coming at you after having just freshly watched the new episode of The Amazing Digital Circus. I um, did not necessarily intend to be making videos about this, but um, Compression Man is beginning to flourish and exist in the indie animation scene. And so with that, I wanted to also become a part of that community and engage with the different aspects of what's going on there. So the new episode dropped uh, today. No, 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 it, it dropped yesterday. But depending on when you all will actually see this, it will have dropped potentially probably two days ago because I have a feeling it dropped yesterday. I didn't get around to watching it today and I probably won't have this edited and out to you guys until um, probably the day after. So it'll probably be 48 hours out. Um, it's safe to say if you haven't watched the episode yet, don't watch this. I will be no holds barred on my uh, spoilers. So if you haven't watched it, do yourself a favor, go and watch it and then come back and remember to watch this after the fact. But um, if you aren't already aware, The Amazing Digital Circus is an independent animation on YouTube produced by Glitch Studios or Glitch Productions, they have kind of taken the indie animation scene by storm and they have this series, The Amazing Digital Circus, which is just getting hundreds of millions of views. Like I think the pilot right now is sitting at like some 346 million views. Um, I'm sure episode two has a ridiculous amount of views as well. And then, of course, um, episode three just dropped and it's already got like 16 million views. So the Amazing Digital Circus is this 3D animated project that is one of the biggest things on the indie animation scene today. Um, it follows these characters who are trapped in this old Internet-esque world and we don't have a whole lot of lore built up as to the how or why of these situations. They are in fact trapped and that they do have identities outside of the circus. Um, we get a little taste of that when Pomni, our main character, is first dropped into this digital world. And she was like, I just put this headset on and now I'm here and then how do I leave? And then she can't leave and that's a whole thing. And so that kind of sets us up for the premise of the digital circus. And then each episode, they go on these um, adventures that are pioneered by Kane, who is like the king of this world, if you will. Um, it's not very clear what exactly he is, but he has kind of omni omnipotent God powers. So safe to say that he's got a lot of pull in what's going on in this universe. Um, so at any rate, the Glitch Productions announced that this series was actually coming to Netflix. That's how big it blew up and how suddenly it blew up. It was just like, boom, all right, now we're coming to Netflix. So congratulations to them. I know there's a lot of people who feel one way or another about um, this project going to Netflix, but I think at the end of the day, it is a good thing for indie animation and um, we should all see it as such. Like. Yes, seeing your favorite content go mainstream, so to speak, always comes with a bit of a um, different kind of gut punch in that it's satisfying that they can finally like get paid reasonably to make this wonderful content, but there's going to probably be new rules and regulations put in place to make the content more so what their host feels that it should be. Now, granted, um, Glitch Productions has made it very clear that they still hold 100% of the creative pull behind the franchise, and so that shouldn't have a major effect on it. But this is the first episode to drop after that major announcement, and like, kind of all eyes are on this um, show. I just wanted to dive in, give my quick thoughts, and see kind of what the rest of the audience is thinking about it and what we all feel is, um, is going on in the world of the amazing digital circus. So episode three opens up and it is um, 
I'm very obvious that it's going to be a horror-themed episode. The trailers have alluded to that. And um, obviously, with it dropping in October, that's probably very likely that it's going to be very spooky. And so, basically, the characters are trying to hold their breath, and they reveal that every character does something unique when they hold their breath. And um, they're trying to figure out what um, Pomni's thing is that she does, which the hue of her character changes as she hold her, holds her breath, which is what we discover. And then, of course, in true Digital Circus fashion, um, What's-His-Guts, Kane shows up, and he's like, Hey, I've got an adventure for everyone! And so it's time for the episodic adventure to begin. And they're going to explore this haunted mansion that um, Kane has curated for them. I believe that Kane does, in fact, develop these um, these adventures for the for the cast to go on. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the purpose is for it. I haven't dove real into the deep lore of this show, but I'm sure there is like a pretty solid reason as to why. I would think maybe it's just to like distract the people from the fact that they're trapped in this digital world. Um, that's my thought process behind it right now, is just kind of a surf surface level enjoyer of the content. Um, so they go into this mansion. There's two doors. There's the scary door and there's the friendly door. And I believe the character's name is Jax. He's the Michael Kovac of the Amazing Digital Circus, the rabbit and the overalls. Um, he throws Kinger into the evil door, and Kinger is attached to Pomni at the time, and so they get thrown into the evil door together, and then um, the rest of them are left outside the evil door, and they can kind of, I guess, go through the, the, the normal door, because the evil door closes behind them, and I'm not sure that they would be all that excited about following them into it, even if it hadn't closed, but... And so Kinger and Pomni go on this kind of fun, spooky adventure. And meanwhile, we have um, Kane and Zubel who are left back in the circus, I guess. And they're having like a therapy session. And so like all in all, I really do enjoy this episode. Um, as someone who's sharing their opinions, I feel like it is customary to say the things that you feel like were less strong about the episodes. So I'll point that out here, but that's not at all to say that I feel like this episode was bad or insufficient. Nothing is perfect, and so it really bothers me when um, a lot of like online reviewer people get on there and they're like, oh, well, this episode wasn't perfect, but it was good, I guess. And I was like, nothing's going to be perfect. Like, there are things in the in entertainment industry that might be perfect for you as an individual. Like, this checks all of my boxes. It is perfect for me. But as an actual, like, piece of art, is it perfect? No, nothing ever is. But art is subjective just as much as it is objective. And it can be perfect for one person and not perfect for the other. With all of the watching I have been doing with this series, and trying to dive into the indie animation scene and trying to see um, what's big, what's hype, what's going on. There's been a lot of talk around this franchise. And one criticism that I have seen that I tend to agree with is the idea that their B plots are oftentimes very weak. I have written a lot of material in different facets. I have six going on seven novels right now that I have independently written and published. And I wrote an entire sitcom that I hosted on Amazon Kindle Vela. And I've written music and all sorts of different things. So I have a pretty strong written background when it comes to these sorts of things. And writing a modern sitcom uh, drama, comedy, whatever. Um, it's customary for the show to have an A and a B plot. I think that's like the standard these days. And I haven't studied TV enough to know like for how long has that been the standard. 
but I do know that like present tense, like when you're writing a story, it's got an A and a B plot. And there's a lot of benefits to that. It gives you something to pan away from so that the audience can have a break from the primary A plot that's going on. And so like, for example, in this one, the A plot is um, Kinger and Pomni's adventure. And the B plot is the therapy session with Zubel and Kane. And um, a lot of their other episodes have A and B plots as well. And a big complaint that I continually hear is that the A plot is very well fleshed out, very well developed, and it's a legitimate thing that carries the story. Where while the B plots just kind of exist and are they exist more or less as something to pan away from, if that makes sense. Like that is absolutely one of the purposes of having an A and B plot, is so that you can pan away from the A, give people a break, and give them the B, and then pan back to the A when you're ready. But um, if the B plot exists only as a pan away point, then it doesn't work to enhance the story. And a good written piece of media, both A and B plots, would enhance the story. And I feel like in this particular episode, that is an issue that we kind of continue to have. The B plot being this therapy session between Kane and Zubel, I think the overall theme of this episode was really just like enhanced character development, which we'll get to when we get back to the A plot. But the B plot kind of tackles character development on two different spectrums. And so you've got Zubel, who is a character that doesn't participate in any of Kane's adventures, I believe. So we don't see a lot of Zubel. And um, we see enough of Kane, but it's interesting to kind of get inside his head as well, because this therapy session winds up being almost as much as a therapy session for Kane as it is for Zubel. And we get to see a little bit of insight into those two characters. Um, Zubel is, I interpreted it as unhappy with her avatar. Um, Obviously, I think they're trying to go deeper and more in depth with it than just, I'm unhappy with my avatar. But the way it exists in the digital circus realm, that is like the surface level interpretation of, of what, she, what they are unhappy with. And then um, Kane, we get inside his head a little bit too in that um, Zubel suggests that his adventures are terrible and that anyone, that no one ever goes on them because they enjoy them. They only go on them to kind of entertain Kane or to keep him um, happy or whatever. And um, Kane has a bit of a meltdown when he's like, these, ad these adventures I curate are the only thing I'm good at. So if you're suggesting that I'm bad at curating adventures and you're suggesting I'm not good at anything, at which point he has his little breakdown and the entire screen or like the entire world starts to break down along with him. And then Zubel's quick to snap him out of it so that the world doesn't get consumed into this giant glitch or whatever. Um, so seeing the more in-depth analysis of those two characters definitely made um, the B-plot more of a... Uh, how do I want to go about this? It made the B-plot more substantial, I think, than historic B-plots, but it still wasn't something that really, like, blew me away and was like, oh, that, that was a good B-plot. Because there's some um, sitcoms and, like, episodes of TV shows where the B-plot outshines the A-plot, and that's how you know that that show has really strong writing. Because it's almost like the A plot and the B plot are competing for the audience's attention rather than the A plot is the attention. The B plot's just kind of there to help it along. And so at any rate, um, it, was, it was fine. Like I said, that's probably my only real complaint with the episode is that the B plots continue to kind of not be great. There was no real resolution there, and there oftentimes isn't with their B-plots. It was like 
they were having a therapy session and then the A plot wrapped up and so then the B plot just immediately ended and then the episode ended. And so, like I said, again, really nitpicky. I'm not over here trying to say that it was a bad episode or that the content is bad in any way, shape, or form. If I had a criticism of the content, that would be my criticism. Um, so moving along into the A plot then, we have Pomni and Kinger who are trapped in the super evil bad door realm. And I enjoy this because in shows when you have an ensemble cast, I really enjoy it when like two characters who you usually don't see together very often get paired together. I think that's always like a really fun thing. And I like it when it happens naturally within the show and not when like the show shoves them together because they've never been together before. Um, a lot of shows that have run courses for like 10 plus years, it's like they come to the realization that they're like, oh, Bob and Sally have never actually been in a scene together, so let's shove them in a scene together so we can say we did that. I think it's better when the writers kind of know their ensemble, t t uh, their ensemble cast and bring the unlikely people together. And I feel like that was what we got in this episode with Pomni and Kinger spending the episode together. I feel like they are very much so the unlikely duo, and um, we see a lot of like Pomni and Ragatha, I feel like, and who else does Pomni hang out with a lot? Like, we see a decent amount of Jax, but I don't know that we see a decent amount of like Pomni and Jax. Pomni had a lot of alone time, I feel like, in the second episode. Now, it's been a while since I've watched the second or first episode, so if I'm misquoting those, I apologize, but I feel like she didn't get, she didn't, she was paired up with the gummy alligator more than she was anyone from the main cast but at any rate seeing so i was already excited seeing that kinger and pomni were going to be spending a lot of time together in this episode because like i said those unlikely pairings are oftentimes very exciting for me and so they're going on this horrific adventure they're dropped into this world where these evil faces are on the wall and a lot of them are like trophy heads of themselves and then there is like one trophy head that wasn't one of the characters within the circus. And so it was pretty obvious at that point, like this was the trophy head that that was going to be significant. And then, um, so they press the tape recorder. They've got the classic reel to reel tape recorder going. And the guy's telling his creepy story about some um, creature that is haunting him or something. And he's concerned that it's gonna like destroy his family, which, and I think they did this on purpose, but the whole thing seemed kind of funny because it's like it, it wasn't like the creature was actively stalking his family. It's that he was convinced that it was going to stalk his family at some point in time. And so he was, I guess, trying to take preventative measures on that and just take the creature out or whatever. And then obviously things did not go as planned. He decapitated the creature and he mounted its head on his trophy wall. And then when he turned back around to the body, the body was gone classic horror movie stuff you know you're like oh this thing by all means is dead and then you look away and when the camera comes back gonzo beans and so obviously right then and there you've got a good classic horror setup um and then they walk into another room because they're trying to get into the dumb waiter and they're trying to get back upstairs because that's where the rest of the cast is but um, the dumb waiter is locked. So they're looking for a key to the dumb waiter, and they enter the study or just a different room. I don't know if they label it as the study. It looked like a study to me. But they enter the study, and um, Kinger finds a, another tape recorder, which leads directly into like my favorite joke of this episode by far. I laughed very hard at this. But he finds this tape recorder, and he presses play, and the, um, the guy keeps talking, and he's basically picking up from where he left off. And he was like, yeah, so like in the first tape, he left off with the body disappeared. And then in the second tape, he was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that the body is trying to reunite with the head. And so I would um, keep an eye on the head at all times and make sure that the body is never allowed to reattach itself to the head. 
And um, Kinger's like, oh, well, that's an inconvenient place to put the lore. And I just died when he said that because it was very self-aware. I'm usually not a fan of meta humor. And it's not directly meta humor as um, these adventures are all compiled by Kane. And so Kane would have actually been the one to put the tape recorder there. Not um, like not like they had written it like it was going to be there by some other force or whatever. And so it was a good poke at um, like real content that has that problem. It was also a good poke at like the meta behind it all and all of that fun stuff. And so that was my that was my number one joke of the episode, and I really enjoyed that. But of course, it was it was inconveniently placed because if he had put that all on one tape, even um, someone who's very familiar with recording things on a tape, like if he had put that all on one tape or one reel, that would have been the best way to do it because then they wouldn't have left the room to begin with. They would have at least had someone stay with the head to make sure that the body didn't come back for it. But at any rate, um, he uh, they then are going to try and go back to the trophy room to check on the head and then the lights go out and they kind of double dip on the joke that they had earlier where he was like oh and this is a conveniently placed power outage and that was not a good double dip in my opinion um the original joke was fantastic i loved it the double dip was not not as great and then um so they go into this whole comedic thing and then they Pass, I think we go back to Zubal and Kinger, or no, 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 Zubal and Kane at what point in time, and then we get back to Kinger and Pomni, and the head is actively like trying to get Kinger. It's like this very twisted Pac Man thing, and the head was, it was good. It was a good, spooky little thing. Um, one thing that I would like to note is that inside the mouth of the head, looked like like a bunch of abstracted um, characters. Um, as we learn more about uh, Kinger and his backstory, I think I understand where they are going with that. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that later, but just take note of that. When the, when the mouth of the head creature is open, there looks to be an, ab an abstracted creature inside of it. And then they eventually make it to the dumbwaiter, the dumbwaiter takes them down to the cellar instead of up to the ground floor where they want to be. And um, in the cellar, they find the corpse of the guy who's been telling this whole story. He's got a shotgun and they find the final tape uh, or the final tape. And then um, it was actually kind of, this is another really funny joke there where she's like walking up to the corpse to grab the shotgun off of his body and she's like oh please don't come alive because that's like what the entire audience is thinking because that's another classic horror movie setup where the corpse is laying there and they mess with it and the corpse is like, ah, jumps out at him or whatever and instead of doing that the corpse is just like all right i'm not gonna come alive or something dumb like that and that made me laugh too so that was funny but um at any rate they grab the shotgun it's a double barrel you get one shot per barrel and Kinger um, takes the demon out, one shot to the chest of the body demon, one shot to the head of the head of the demon, and it seems donezo, which is another thing that was really kind of entertaining to see. Kinger was very much so on it in this episode, and he was like a shining star in this adventure, and he was doing really well with everything. And that's a contrast, a stark contrast to his character, who's usually just completely bonkers and has no idea what's going on and doesn't know his up from his down or his left from his right. And then he's over here, here like, carrying this adventure. And so that was really cool to see, see him in his element, see him carrying an adventure. And then the last tape, the actual last tape, starts rolling after he harmed the, or after he killed the demon. And he's like, yeah, it turns out that um, this creature is actually um, just like an angel. And if you bring harm to it, then you're doomed to like spend the rest of your eternity in hell or whatever. And so then Pomni and um, King are dragged down to hell. And they face this hallway with all these weird kind of creatures in it. And they're trying to figure out how to cross the hallway. 
and then Pomni just freaks out and runs in, and she gets possessed by a demon, and then the demon um, uh, Kinger is able, because he has detachable hands, he's able to grab her with his hands and pull her back to where they are, and um, when he does that, he's wrestling with a demon, and we get our first little piece of Kinger lore while he's wrestling with the demon, and the Kinger's like, how, or the, the demon's like, how's your wife doing, Kinger? And um, at first, I just kind of pass it away as a throwaway line because, like, when, like, guys crap talk each other, they tend to just throw each other's wives or loved ones in the fire, and that's just what we do. And so I was like, I just kind of threw that away initially. And then he successfully beats the demon out of her. And, like, at this point, we're, like, full-on, like, poor Pomni mode because Pomni's been having just the worst go at things this entire franchise and um and she got uh she got stuck in a loop of exits that didn't even exist in episode one she befriended an npc who got evaporated in episode two and then now here we are in episode three and she just got her whole body and existence possessed by some evil entity and so they sit down because things are starting to get heavy here and this is where I feel like the amazing digital circus always shines is in the moments when they get emotional and heavy, they always succeed in those moments. Like when the NPC alligator gummy worm guy got, um, when he came to the realization that he was an NPC, that he was just a fake shell of a person, um, that was a very deep and emotional scene and it felt very real and it was a very creative way to go about tackling a more realistic problem of loneliness and, and emptiness that plagues people in reality and how it related to this NPC character. It was very well done. I, I highly suggest you go watch episode two and, and see that for yourself. Don't let me describe it to death to you. So at any rate, um, we kind of, I kind of walked into this one expecting that. Like, most of the episodes get emotional at some point in time. And so I was ready for my emotional fix. And Kinger um, sits down, and I forget how it gets brought up. Um, the details of it aren't fresh in my mind. But essentially, Kinger had a wife in the digital circus, and she abstracted. And, oh, I remember now how it was brought up, because... Um, Pomni was like, you know, you seem very different in this adventure. Like, you're, like, very much so on your stuff. You're well put together. You're, you're well composed. You know what's going on. When normally you're just kind of scatterbrained and have no idea about anything. And Kinger goes into how the darkness helps him calm his mind because he had a wife who abstracted. And in her final moments before being thrown down in the cellar... Um, she was able to calm down enough for her to touch her one last time while they were in the darkness of his fort. And then, of course, we can assume that shortly thereafter, Cain would have appeared and, and thrown her into the cellar. And so he's like, that's why darkness allows me to gather my mind and brings me to a better place because it brings me to that memory, which was like the last fond memory that I've had in the circus. And it really is a, a very deep and foretelling thing for Kinger. Because Kinger frequently makes these pillow fortresses that he hides in. And it's just kind of, he's just, that's what he does. And now we know why. Like, he's hiding in the darkness because that's where his memories lie. That's where his composure exists. And so it brought a really good it shined a really good light on kinger as a character and it was a huge highlight for him we also got to through a minor throwaway line learn that he is some sort of um it professor or something because he's like i took it for seven years and this is where i wound up and so good good character building on kinger's part there like i said the whole story with his wife and the darkness and all of that you explained perfectly um, why he is the way he is, and basically when he's not in his dark zone, when he's not in his his element, that's why he's he's so scatterbrained and his thoughts and stuff is all over the place. Um, they lead 
into a deeper monologue as they oftentimes do um, about just like cherishing moments and not knowing when you will be your last moment with any given individual in your life. And it's so very true. And obviously like that's a very common thing, theme that like a lot of people try to say, like cherish the people you love, cherish your memories um, and just live life to the fullest that you can. And it, it hit home really strong and really well in this episode and in the way that it was presented and in the way it was said, despite the fact that it is very much so a common message to, to share. And like a lot of times when you're sharing the common messages, um, it's easy for them to be convoluted or come across as cliched, but this common message did not have that problem at all. It was very, very well done. And then um, shortly after that, they reveal that they're like, oh, if we hold our breath, then the creatures won't be able to get us because they can only get us while we're breathing. And so then Kinger and Pomni cross through the hallway of evil spirity things while they're holding their breath, which is a nod to the beginning of the episode because Pomni was holding her breath and changing hues. And Jax is like, yeah, and when Kinger holds his breath, he glows. And so we saw this bright, vibrant Kinger glowing as he kind of led Pomni through the hallway of the evil spirits and stuff, and then through the hallway and up into the next door, and then they get reunited with the rest of the group. And we all kind of come together in the end. And then the episode more or less just wraps up from there. It said what it has to say. It's touched its emotional beats and and really just kind of ends at that point. They switch back to the B-plot where Kane is talking to um, Zubal, and then he's like, oh, shoot, they're done, with the, um, they're done with my adventure. And so they go in there to, um, to greet them or whatever, and they have a quick little exchange, and then Kinger is quick to go back into his wacky personality, and then he immediately retreats to his fort, and then Jax was like, he leans in talking to Pommy. He's like, so how was that spending time with that nut job or whatever? And she was like, you know, it wasn't so bad. And so it was like Jax was really hoping that he was going to torment Pomni somehow by sticking her with Kinger. But it turned out to be a really strong, good adventure and a nice way to look into his psyche as a character. And so all in all, my ending thoughts, like it's another fabulous episode of yet to be disappointed by a, a single episode that they've put out of this show. Now, they're only three episodes deep in a nine-episode run, so we're not quite halfway there yet, but we're getting kind of close. And so it'll be interesting when it's all said and done to see when all episodes, all nine episodes are out. Like, is there a standout bad episode as opposed to the rest of them, or is it going to just be a solid series? Because when you have a nine-episode launch, like you have the ability to just make every episode a banger, um, obviously, the more episodes you crank out, the more potential you have for a bad episode to pop up. But so far, I have been nothing but pleased with The Amazing Digital Circus. If you haven't already watched it, I strongly, I strongly suggest that you go out there and watch some Amazing Digital Circus. It is worth every minute that you will spend watching it. And what it's doing for indie animation as a whole is huge. It's monumental. It's very impactful. And I think in the long run, it is a very good thing for indie animations. If you're at all interested in supporting my channel, I ask that you follow the link in the description to watch Compression Man, my very own independent animation. And until the next time you guys see me, have a fabulous day.